So what I was going to do today uh, to finish off is to talk about our branch's um, strategy in investing in science. But that strategy also reflects our um, approach to forest management as well. So today we heard a lot about um, emulation of natural disturbance and uh, we heard um, some different perspectives on that. Now we see emulation of natural disturbance as a, actually a very extremely valuable um, tool in forest management, but we don't see it as the be all and end all. So we do invest a fair bit in understanding natural disturbances. So through FRI research, the Healthy Landscapes Program, and through our fire program, we want to understand um, fire regimes across the province, and we have some very large projects looking at what were natural disturbances in the past, what did the landscapes look like that resulted from them, and how, have that, how has that changed under, um, in, the, in the current situation. And we're just starting up a large project right now, which will involve Chris Stockdale in trying to advance some of the work that he's done with that Mountain Legacy Project, uh, uh, Repeat Photography, but also working with Dave Anderson and people at UBC and some other um, uh, institutions across Canada to understand the fire regimes um, not only across all of Alberta, but also focusing in spe specifically in southwestern Alberta, where we think we have some very unique um, fire regimes there, a mixed fire regime where we have uh, uh, frequent fires that don't kill all the trees. And, um, and we think that has very significant impl implications on the kind of forest management we do, and also retention, actually, as well. But natural disturbance, uh, emulation of natural disturbance isn't, um, and, and the patterns that come from it, um, is only part of the puzzle. We recognize that fire is different than harvesting. There's many processes on there that we don't emulate through harvesting. So we need to understand the nuts and bolts, the ecosystem processes that are going on. And so um, it's, uh, th therefore our investments in projects like the EMEND project are extremely important. We need to understand how an ecosystem functions, what are the interrelationships between soils, um, uh, microorganisms, you know, uh, plants, uh, trees, and, and, and the animals there. And how do those relationships change when we interact with them? How do they change naturally with uh, climate change and with other, um, other changes to the ecosystem? And projects like the, uh, the EMEND project actually test that fundamental hypothesis that was that the natural, that emulation natural disturbance approach um, uh, makes the assumption that if we recreate the habitat types and the patterns that were created under natural disturbances, we'll get the biodiversity that w w existed at that time. That's a huge assumption and a huge um, hypothesis that needs to be tested, and EMEND is one of the ways we test that hypothesis. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump to this slide, which isn't even from Alberta or Canada. It's actually um, taken by Jamie Bruja, who joined me and a number of others, Ellen McDonald as well. We did a tour to Sweden a number of years ago. And it was a very interesting uh, tour for us to look at what happens to a system where, um, where forestry has been very in, a very intensive process for uh, several hundred years, especially the last century. So they have a long history of forest management. And in, to make a long story short, they've very significantly simplified their system. So I remember growing up in the 70s, and we all talked about Swedish forestry, how fantastic it was. They don't waste wood, they maximize volumes, they, uh, they replant everything that they, that they harvest so well, and it was, a, it was considered idealized forestry. But since then, we've discovered there has been very significant consequences. So this is a Norway spruce plantation in, in central Sweden. And, uh, you know, there's no coarse weed debris, no dead and decay processes happening, uh, very sim uh, simple structure, one species. Uh, in the stand and, um, you know, with very predictable imp implications for biodiversity. So Sweden is, uh, is making valiant efforts to turn that around. They've recognized through similar programs to, uh, as EMEND in Scandinavia that they, you know, that, they're, that these complex structures and, and, um, and pre-disturbance legacies that are, are extremely important for managing for biodiversity. But it's a very long process. It will be a very long process for them. It'll take a long time, even now with their um, very aggressive new uh, regulations they put in place, they'll achieve only a fraction of the course we do debris and the stand level structure that we get kind of by default in a lot of the management we do. So it was very instructive for us to basically learn from Sweden's uh, 
history and, um, and think about what is the future for us that we'd like to see here in Alberta. Do we want to go along that trajectory or do we want to maintain a different trajectory? So the structure retention strategy that was released yesterday, and um, Dave Anderson mentioned that he was kind of jittery from coffee. Well, I'm feeling the same thing. I've been drinking a lot of coffee the last few days, and yesterday at 3.30, we finally were able to hit send to, um, to send this directive out for review. So some of you have already had a chance to read it in the last day. But this, um, this directive for us is a very significant part of the journey that we're on in Alberta, uh, moving from a sustained yield forestry, which was sustaining a single value where we were replanting forests and trying to sustain them for the future, but focused on a single value, trying to maintain merchantable volume for, for harvesting. But the evolution from that, that paradigm to sustainable forest management, where we recognize that there's other values that are uh, extremely important as well in forest management, including uh, the maintenance of biodiversity, ecosystem integrity. And to do that, um, uh, means uh, managing for a lot more than just, just uh, timber volumes. So as part of that evolution, back in 2006, we released the Forest Management Planning Standard, which required companies to set objectives for biodiversity in their plans. And one of those objectives was for stand-level structure. So at that time, we, it was a big step forward. We recognized that that was an important piece to the puzzle. Companies started developing uh, structure retention strategies, and you've heard some of the evolutions of how those strategies developed from DMI and ALPAC. Um, what this new directive does is actually set the expectations a little bit more clearly and a little further up again. In the past, we negotiated um, targets in each individual plan. So the social, economic, environmental trade-offs were being made constantly within each forest management plan. What we're doing in this new directive is we're saying, there's enough science out there for us to, uh, to actually set a minimum target that we would like to see for structure retention. It's not an intent to try to homogenize um, you know, all management to a, uh, you know, to a single number. It's simply a recognition that if we are going to be considering the kind of structural complexity that we see in natural stands, um, we need a certain level, minimum level of retention to actually be able to approximate that. Um, the comment made was made earlier about you know young forests having high uh, levels of biodiversity, and I remember um, uh, a previous scientist I worked with, a colleague of Dave Coates and Smithers, Jim Pojar, used to talk about wild young forests, and what made those forests wild was that they had high levels of complexity to them. They weren't simply young plantations of young trees. They had lots of legacies left over from the pre-disturbance forests, and. Um, the structure retention strategy that we're bringing forward is to try to bring that, those wild characteristics into our, into our young plantations, into our young managed forests that allow that high levels of biodiversity to, uh, to, to be seen in those, in those young forests. Now we recognize that a structure retention strategy is only one piece of the puzzle. It's a stand level strategy that deals with within, harv uh, within um, uh, harvest blocks. You still need to deal with rates of disturbance across landscapes. How much old forest do you want to have? Um, we heard a talk just now on grizzly bear, like how do we manage for a, fo a focal species like grizzly bear or caribou? And then there's landscape level issues of cumulative effects of oil and gas and forestry and settlement. All those are other questions as well. And this is, we see this as one piece of the puzzle. So the final slide is just, I just want to acknowledge our our um, academic research partners that we work with. And these are the, just the current ones. So the University of Alberta has been a lead in EMEND and uh, many other uh, uh, research initiatives that we're involved with. Foothills Research Institute with the Grizzly Bear Program that we just heard about. Healthy Landscapes Program. Also a very active mountain pine beetle ecology program. The big new research initiative we have in southwestern Alberta looking at the, the mixed fire regimes there is, is being uh, uh, funded by Alberta Innovates Biosolutions and Energy and Environment Solutions has worked with us to co-fund um, with the oil and gas industry a couple of biodiversity research chairs. Um, the Canadian Forest Service is very actively involved in helping develop some of these fire regime models that we're working on. Tomorrow you'll be hearing a lot of uh, talks about uh, wet areas mapping which was developed at the University of New Brunswick. And some of the modeling researchers that we're working with on the fire regimes are at UBC. And, uh, and the Mount Legacy Project at uh, University of Victoria. 